you speak of the of the uh, case in uh, in Australia. Yeah. Well, in Australia, there was a man uh, who uh, it's claimed infected three women, and I think one woman died. In the defense of the man, uh, I don't know if the, I don't know the details if he did it deliberate, if he knew. I don't want to get into that and what the punishment should be. But the question is, is his defense was an absurdity, but uh, that the virus uh, didn't exist. The biggest problem with the HIV theory of AIDS is HIV. There is a group of AIDS denialists that say that HIV does not exist and has never been isolated, uh, which is <laughs> as, as bizarre as it gets. You and your colleagues not only state that HIV does not cause AIDS, but you take an even greater leap and say HIV does not exist. Is that correct? Oh, it is partly correct. We do not say that HIV doesn't exist. It may exist, but the presently available data does not prove its existence. But how can you say that when world-renowned scientists like Dr. Gallo and Dr. Fauci say HIV does exist? Are you telling me and the world that they're all wrong? No, what, I, what we're saying is there is the evidence there, the data in the scientific literature, which is published. Scientists interpret data differently, and we interpret the evidence one way, and they interpret it in a different way. So in our view, the evidence does not prove the existence of HIV. We've all seen pictures. We've seen electron micrographs of HIV. How can you say something that we see isn't there? You didn't see electromicrograph of HIV. What we see is electromicrograph of particles which look like retroviruses. But uh, it's one thing to look like and another thing is to be a virus. The one thing I don't understand is how can you question the existence of a virus when there was an international lawsuit against the United States government and Robert Gallo for stealing the French virus? I mean, it seems to me there must be a virus there if somebody stole it. That's the problem. Under no circumstances, uh, Robert Gallo could have stolen uh, Montagnier's virus, even if there was such a virus. Because what Montagnier sent to Gallo was uh, um, supernatants from his cultures. And in the supernatants, the virus don't last for too long. And in fact, the the, the particles have to have knobs on their, or spikes on their surface to be infectious. And these knobs are lost. And in fact, nobody has proven that they exist. But even if they exist on HIV or the particles, they are lost very rapidly. So it is impossible for Montagnier's, for, uh, to have, for Gallo to have stolen a virus from Montagnier. So can you prove to me that HIV doesn't exist? I can, I can show you what the evidence shows, what, what Montagnier, for example, presented, because everybody accepts that Montagnier is the discoverer of HIV. And I can show you the evidence which Montagnier presented and claims to have proven the existence of HIV. And I will explain to you why Montagnier's evidence does not prove the existence of HIV. What do we mean by virus isolation or virus purification? Um, these are jargon words in virology and they, uh, they're not very precise. They mean different things to different people. Now, Dr. Gallo and Dr. Fauci talked a lot about isolation and purification. Can you tell me what the difference is between the two? Isolation, what was it? Isolation and purification. Of the virus? Yes. Well, you isolate a virus by um, um, finding the virus which causes a disease. And you purify a virus by making a lot of, I mean, just by purifying it so you get a pure virus. Okay. I don't, I don't understand what the issue. Well, they, they, issue. Can, they, they interchange the two, and I wasn't sure I see. If, if it was the same thing or if it was two totally different. Uh, well, it depends on how they used it. Okay. 
Can, can you explain the process of HIV isolation? Well, I didn't Dr. Gallo do that? I mean, he actually isolated it, so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, why should I do all of this? This is all textbook stuff you're asking me. I'm not quite sure what's behind your question about isolation. I don't want to be your textbook, you know? Okay. I got other things to do. Isolation is essentially um, getting the, the virus from the patient and being able to transmit this virus to another cell to reproduce the infection and to have a continual supply of the virus, and that's called an isolation. Purification is just obtaining the virus uh, free of cellular contaminants or other contaminations, but it doesn't mean necessarily that the virus is infectious. Virus isolation, I would take to mean that uh, you take some infected material, like a, a blood sample uh, from someone who you uh, think or, or believe may have HIV infection, may already have symptoms of AIDS, and you try and grow the virus uh, from that blood sample. So you would put the blood sample into culture, you would stimulate the lymphocytes to proliferate with various growth factors or cytokines and you would harvest the virus from the, uh, the culture medium that you are growing it in. Uh, you would spin out the cells, um, separate the cells from the supernatants and you would look for the virus in the, uh, in the culture medium. That needn't be a pure medium because you can use markers of the virus that tell you it's there such as the reverse transcriptase enzyme. So you can see evidence of the virus without actually purifying particles. In that very first paper from the French group, published in May 1983, uh, there were two things that uh, uh, appeared to uh, class it amongst the retrovirus uh, uh, family. Uh, one was reverse transcriptase activity and one was actually looking at virus particles with the electron microscope. The title of the 1983 paper by Montagnier and his colleague is Isolation of a T-Lipotropic Retrovirus from a Patient at Risk of Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, AIDS. Now, the word isolation means to obtain something or to place something apart or to obtain a, sep a substance separate from everything else. Apparently, Montagnier by isolation did not mean this, but something totally different. And I'll, I'll explain to what he meant by, by isolation. He did three main experiments. The first experiment, he took lymphocytes from a patient, now is known as Brew, and he cultured them with many uh, substances including PHA and other growth factors. What are growth factors? They are substances which make cells to multiply. Okay. Right? Or to live, and to, to, to stay alive in the culture. Mm -hmm. And after 15 days, he discovered their reverse transcriptase activity. And they claimed that this proved the existence of a retrovirus in their patient, in their patient cells. Every two days we were taking the supernatant, looking for the presence of the enzymes that transform RNA to DNA, the reverse transcriptase, because we know that this enzyme is associated to virus particle. So we were testing for this enzyme activity in the supernatant. Uh, what's so special about reverse transcription? Uh, Any time you're searching for a new agent, you want to have some simple measurement of the presence of that agent. Um, in times past, you would put it on cells, cell culture in the laboratory, and suddenly these beautiful cells will all start turning into dead cells. You say, oh, something's there. And then you 
put that into an electron microscope and look and you can find it. All those are rather difficult things to use. If there's something that the virus produces in this culture, you don't necessarily have to see all the dead stuff. You just can have, take off some of the liquid it's growing in and test it. Um, and one thing you can test for a retrovirus is reverse transcriptase. And it just happens to be that's a laboratory test available for it. So you just take a little bit off, put it into a chemical assay, and you can do it very, very simply. So it's a matter of something that you can put a lot of specimens through and something that's simple to do so you can really uh, uh, get a, maybe not a direct picture of the virus, you can't see it, but you can get evidence that it is there, like fingerprints. Then he took the lymphocytes, which originated from bruised uh, lymph nodes, he took these lymphocytes and cultured them with the lymphocytes of a healthy blood donor. And there, again, he detected reverse transcriptase activity. So Montagnier did, found reverse transcriptase activity, and according to him, this proved that the retrovirus was there. But the, the only way to say that the existence of reverse transcriptase or the detection of reverse transcriptase activity proves the retrovirus was there is only if reverse transcription was specific to retroviruses, which is not the case. In fact, then today nearly everybody accepts that reverse transcription or reverse transcription activity is non-specific to retroviruses. In fact, at present, everybody accepts that reverse transcript transcription is present in all normal cells. In fact, as far back as at the beginning of the 1970s, Gallo himself have shown that normal cells, when put in culture and they're stimulated or they're cultured with, PA, with PHA, they will start uh, mm, mm, having reverse transcriptase activity. Montagnier put the bruised cells in a culture. Into culture, he added different growth factors, including PHA. And after 15 days, he detected reverse transcriptase activity. However, PHA by itself in normal cell, and this was known by Baresinus, the principal author, and Gallo proved it at the beginning of the 1970s, that the PHA itself causes reverse transcription in normal cells. So he put something in the cell which was causing a reverse transcription, and yet he said that this proves the existence of a, of a retrovirus there. So you're saying that what they found might just be the actual substance they put in the culture and not a virus? Definitely. That is, that is, that is, is their evidence. And Why would they do that? But as you know, she knew that in 1973, Gallo proved it at the beginning, in 1972, I think, was his paper. I don't know. Now, everybody accepts that reverse transcriptase activity is a characteristic of retroviruses, but it's not specific to retroviruses. But in all my interviews with scientists, they all say that reverse transcription is unique to retroviruses, and that's how they knew that there was a virus in their culture. Once you um, have produced, you know, you produce something in the extracellular medium, you can do actually several things. One thing is that if we expect or suspect it's a retrovirus, like HTLV1, the leukemia virus, what we can do is look for uh, what we call reverse transcriptase activity, the enzyme which is unique to these viruses. Yeah, the scientific procedure was multifaceted. Um, I mean, I had a good size lab, and so we had divided people up into different primary goals and uh, would meet daily. Uh, and the first goal was if a patient has fully developed AIDS, forget risk groups at the time. We didn't want to get into the risk group. You know, they, had, they had AIDS, documented AIDS. Could we take their blood, get their T cells like we would do with any 
This is like the leukemias, like we did with the leukemias, the same protocols we did with leukemia. Take those T cells, clean them up from other cells, grow them with interleukin-2, our old friend, and see if we could find any evidence of release of virus particles and if we were right that they would be retroviruses and how to do that was with a surrogate marker. You don't use electron microscopy in those days except maybe one or two pictures just to confirm or to see the structure of this particular retrovirus. The assay was reverse transcriptase. Well, I don't know whom you interviewed, but if you don't believe me, go and ask Baltimore or Vermus, and I'm sure they will confirm that reverse transcriptase activity is a characteristic of retroviruses, but it's not specific to them. What do you mean when you say reverse transcription is a characteristic of retroviruses, but not specific? Oh, well, let me give you an example. Hair is a characteristic of humans. You know, black, white, or yellow, we all have hair. But it's not specific, because there are many animals, for example, cats, dogs, which also have hair. And finding a hair in a room, it doesn't mean that a human being was there, or a cat or a dog. Are retroviruses the only ones that can reverse transcribe? Ah, uh, no. There are other forms of reverse transcription that are used in various, um, various ways inside the cell. For instance, the ends of chromosomes are made by a reverse transcription process. That's how they're maintained stable. The, um, there is reverse transcription in the inheritance of all of our cells, which comes about from endogenous genetic elements in the cells or in the cells of our ancestors. Because once that information gets into our, into our cells, into our genomes, it stays there forever. Um, so it could be that we've inherited information from monkeys or from other animals that are, that are in our, our uh, lineage. Um, and so, no, reverse transcription is actually very widespread. Something like 50% of the DNA in our cells comes about by reverse transcription. Oh, that much? Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. That was 1 to 2%. <laughs> Going back to, uh, I thought it was 1.5 to 2%. Uh, mm -hmm. The 50% that the retroviral DNA, or retroviral genes in our DNA, what biological function do they serve? Now, we've got to make a distinction. When I said 50%, I'm saying 50% of the DNA came about by reverse transcription but it's not all retroviruses. Lots of it is just uh, repeated elements that are there as what we generally consider to be um, parasitic DNA. DNA which is, as other people call it, selfish DNA. DNA which is in there because it's able to copy itself and reintegrate itself in other places. And this is something that's going on all the time. Um, and it builds up. Why do you think they used reverse transcription to prove the existence of a virus if they knew that it wasn't specific to viruses? I don't know. It's as simple as this. I don't know. In fact, they went one step further. In the second experiment, they have taken the cells from their patient and mixed them with cells from a normal blood donor. And in that culture, Again, they put PHA and other growth factors, substances, which make the cell to survive and grow. And again, they found reverse transcriptase activity. And this time, they claim that the finding of reverse transcriptase activity in the second culture proves that the virus was transmitted from the patient's cells to the normal donor cells. And in fact, they say that this proves isolation of HIV. But they must have used some other criteria to state that they had a new virus. There was no other criteria in the first, they had a third experiment, but in the first and second experiment, that's how they are described in, in their paper. It was the first experiment, reverse transcriptase activity, the second experiment, reverse transcriptase activity. They are the only evidence they have published. So in the so from first... From the first and the second experiment. So in both experiments, they fed the culture substances 
which artificially cause reverse transcription? Yes. Yes, they fed them, you know, just one of them, PHA, by itself, it will cause reverse transcription in normal cells, in non-infected cells. What are your problems with the third experiment? Well, the problems, first of all, again, they took the supernated, the fluid from their second experiment, and put it in a culture which contained umbilical cord lymphocytes. And in that culture, they also found reverse transcriptase activity. Again, the reverse transcriptase activity, they already used there this PHA and other substances which can cause reverse transcription in any culture, if the conditions are right. Then we have the virus particles. They have published electromicrographs showing virus-like particles budding from the cells and released in the supernatant. But just seeing virus-like particles is no proof that the viruses, that they are viruses, because you can have virus-like particles and they are not viruses. In fact, the, 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 the third problem with the virus, with the particle, is that they use umbilical cord lymphocytes, which originate from placenta. In placenta, it was known in the 70s that they release virus-like particles and they have reverse transcriptase activity. So finding them in this culture is no proof that they originated from Montagnier's patient. In Montagnier's paper, they publish electron micrographs of HIV. No. We see pictures of the virus. We see pictures. These particles were in, uh, as I said, in umbilical cord lymphocytes. And umbilical cord lymphocytes originate from placenta. And there was already a lot of evidence by this time that placenta can release virus-like particles. What's more is Montagnier, when he described the particles he has seen, he said these particles are typical type C particles. Viruses, are, the retroviruses are um, classified in different um, categories, which, one of which is type C particle. And they said that the virus they have seen is a typical type C particle. Typical type C particles have been many times published in the 1970s from normal placenta. In fact, most of the placentas was shown to have reverse transcriptase activity and typical type C particles. So finding these particles there, even if there are virus, they could have been just originating from the normal placenta. So finding the particles and finding reverse transcriptase activity in the umbilical cone lymphocyte culture does not prove that the patient was infected with a virus. The two main things that told you you had a retrovirus was the reverse transcriptase activity and the fact that the cells so died. That, and then we immediately uh, call our guy who was responsible for electron microscopy mm -hmm. and said, please, could you look on them under the microscope uh, whether you can see virus particle uh, and if uh, it resembled to a, a retrovirus. Okay. Okay. And what um, what did you see? What did you guys see when you looked under the electron microscope? And after after quite, uh, it was very difficult because it was only few cells infected, so it was a very difficult task for him uh, to find a cells that was just producing this particle. But finally, he found it, and he found one lymphocyte with a budding particle typical of retrovirus, and very close from these cells, one complete mature particle that resembled to a retrovirus. In that um, paper, he had only one electron micrograph, and the virus um, could be identified as sort of a retrovirus, but it could have also, could have also been an arena virus. Now, these are specifics that, that that are only important for experts. But when we saw that photo, we said, mm, suggestive, but not convincing. So I've seen these publications, stamp-sized images. It's a nuisance. 
it's a nuisance. You do not really see much. And uh, I do not know how good electron microscopy was really done, but uh, they probably should have done a bit more. And then they would, they would have been very safe. And electron microscopy is an art and a science. Art and science. And nobody is able to judge what the electron microscopist is really doing. You have to have experts discussing these things. Sometimes people are far from the microscope. They do not understand structure and function. They like to have a nice image, that's all. They do not understand sometimes, and that's a danger. I could imagine if uh, Montagnier would have pushed the structure, the fine structure of HIV a bit more, he would have been more convincing. Would I be right in saying that from the pictures alone, though, in culture, you can't prove what virus you found yet? Of course, electron microscopy is not sufficient to, to prove you have a retrovirus. That's clear. You need uh, other characteristics like the density. The reverse transcriptase activity is the key, the key enzyme, uh, which is at well, that time was only associated with retroviruses. You know, that's... So how we describe it first, you know, we didn't describe the electron microscopy as a proof. Mm -hmm. We described the reverse transcriptase activity as, as a proof it was a retrovirus, but here also we were criticized. Uh, by <laughs> some people from Gallo's lab saying, uh, are you sure you have a reverse transcriptase activity there? Could it be a cellular DNA polymerase? You know, we had this kind of question. So Montaigne, he wanted to show not only that he had a retrovirus, that, but that the retrovirus was new, was not one of the two other retroviruses which Gallo claimed to have discovered at the end of the 1970s and the beginning of 1980s in leukemic patients. For this, first of all, he said he purified HIV. He obtained by purification we all agree, he said, and Montagnier himself admits that to prove that uh, a virus is a new virus, then you have to show that it has proteins which were not present in any other retrovirus. And to do that, he said, you must purify the virus. He admitted that in 1997 that you must purify the virus. And in 1983, he claimed to have done exactly that, to have purified the HIV particle. Now, we may uh, have uh, differences as to what isolation means, but when it comes to purification, there is no disagreement. We, by purification, they mean to obtain particles, retrovirus particles, separate from anything else which, at, at least from anything else, which contains proteins and RNA. Now, when this virus is in this supernatal, it's not purified, okay? Because the cells are releasing plenty of things, not only the virus, mm -hmm. the cellular protein and so on, okay? Yeah. So that means that in the supernatant, you have a mixture of everything, including the virus. Then you have to purify. Okay. Okay. This is the second step. Then you try to purify the virus from all this mess. When uh, we started in the early 80s, we, we were trying to purify the virus by uh, a sucrose gradient. Retrovirus particles are purified using a laboratory procedure developed over 40 years ago known as density gradient centrifugation. The cell culture that is undertaken by the scientist to produce workable quantities of virus results in a liquid suspension made up of cells, macroscopic and microscopic cellular debris, virus particles, if any are present, and culture fluids. This suspension is spun in a low-speed centrifuge 
which creates a sediment consisting of the cells and heavier solid material, and, above the sediment, a liquid supernatant containing the much lighter microscopic material. If retroviral particles are present, this is where they will be distributed. Next, a small portion of the supernatant is removed and very gently placed on top of a solution of sucrose. This sucrose solution is prepared in a special way such that its density increases gradually from the top to the bottom of the tube. In this diagram, the layers of different densities are shown as discrete bands, but in the real world of the laboratory, these layers gradually merge into one another. Purification by this technique relies on the fact that particulate matter in the supernatant sample will gradually sink down through the sucrose solution until it reaches a place in the gradient where the sucrose solution and the particulate matter have the same density. When an object gets to this portion of the gradient, it cannot go any further. It is exactly like trying to force a tennis ball to stay put at the bottom of a bucket of water. As soon as you let it go, it bounces back up to where it wants to float according to its density in water. This means that in the sucrose density gradient, all objects of the same density will eventually congregate at the same place in the gradient. In the case of retrovirus particles, this is where the density of the sucrose reaches 1.16 grams per mil. Because the particulate matter in the culture supernatant is so light and tiny, the passage of the sample through the gradient has to be speeded up by spinning the tube in another kind of centrifuge known as an ultracentrifuge. This machine rotates the tube at speeds between 40 to 60,000 revolutions per minute and produces a force many thousands of times gravity. In this diagram we have assumed the supernatant sample contains retrovirus particles and you can see them gradually moving through the gradient and being arrested at the 1.16 grams per mil density. Here is a short demonstration to illustrate how a sucrose density gradient solution can be used to separate objects of different densities, in this case beans and macadamia nuts. In this simplified version we will use a two band density gradient consisting of water with a density of 1 gram per mil and sucrose at a density of approximately 1.5 grams per mil. First we prepare our sucrose solution by dissolving sucrose, ordinary table sugar, in water. Then we make our two density layer solution by carefully pouring our lower density layer, the water, on top of the denser sucrose layer. Next we place our sample on the top of the two layer solution. Since these objects are so much larger and heavier than virus particles, gravity is more than sufficient to propel them through the gradient. In fact, as you can see, in this experiment the separation is virtually instant. There is no need to spin the glass in a centrifuge. The result is one density band consisting of nothing but beans, and another density band consisting of nothing but macadamias. In other words, these objects have been successfully purified. What may not be obvious is the part your eyes play in this experiment. Without looking at the two density bands, which is equivalent to performing the electron microscopy, you will not be able to tell if any objects are present, what is their morphology, and whether or not they are pure. Well, what's the purpose of the purification then? Well, to, uh, to make sure uh, uh, you have uh, a real virus, uh, you know, uh, so Montaigne claimed to, to prove that he had a, a particles, he had proteins which are not present in any other vi retrovirus, he purified the virus. But he did not publish any electron micrographs of the purified material to prove, you know, you see in his believing. And uh, they claimed that they had purified material, but there were no electron micrographs. And it, it is, this is one of the conditions where Barres and Jean-Claude Charmaine put it in 90, 1973. You must have picture of the purified virus and show that the material contains nothing else but particles with the same physical characteristics. But no such pictures were published. Is it important to photograph where the virus is banned? in the gradient? Yeah, <clears throat> because retrovirology has also some, some history. These are established techniques 
If you go to C-type particles, they can be easily bended and they are stable. And if you think HIV is another a new retrovirus, you have to go the same way, just to, to be acknowledged as, as a retrovirologist dealing with that new virus in a proper way. Hans Gelderblum, he said it's important to photograph the density gradient where viruses bend. Why is that an important step? Because uh, this is, I mean, electron microscopy, for example, it's always very important to see the morphology of the virus particle. Uh, it's in the region of the density gradient, okay, where you think you have a virus purified, and I will say in good shape. If you check after by electron microscopy, the electron microscopy will tell you, okay, you have the right structure of the virus particle with all the envelope which is uh, uh, on the surface of the membrane okay. okay because very often when you make purification you uh, alter all this process making uh, sucrose gradients and centrifugation it's a uh, it forces, you know, on the virus, pressure on the viruses, and it does not like it too much. Mm -hmm. Especially for HIV, where the envelope uh, protein, which are anchored on, uh, on the membrane, are not uh, covalently anchored. So that means that uh, very easily you can lose the envelope protein. Now oh, the GP120? Uh, yeah. So it's important to check then on the uh, electron microscope whether the structure of your virus is the one that you are looking for with all its viral protein, the envelope protein, structural protein, everything. You have the right shape, the right structure. And it also shows you what isn't there, correct? Exactly, also. So you're saying Montagne never proved the existence of a new retrovirus because he didn't photograph in the test tube? Mm, or, as I said, he says it is essential to purify the virus to prove that there are, uh, the, the, it has proteins which are not present in any other virus. That's the only way to prove that you have a new virus. But he did not publish pictures. So since he did not publish pictures, we don't know what he had in his purified virus. May have, it is possible that he had purified virus, but it's possible that he did not have anything there. And that's what we've been asking from the very beginning. Why there were no pictures, which are essential to, to, to prove purification. When purifying, Gelder Bloom told me it's important to photograph the density gradient where virus is banned. Why is that a crucial step? Well, Gelderblom, I know him well, he's a good electron microscopist in, in Berlin. And actually, um, he gave me the best picture of my virus. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, of course, in order to, to purify, you have to make this uh, sucrose gradient density uh, an equilibrium uh, to have a sharp band. And if you take that sharp band, you have uh, almost uh, pure. Not completely pure, because there are cell, uh, cell vesicles which have the same density. This is why you don't see uh, in, in the picture, you have a mixture of uh, uh, cell uh, vesicles, cellular vesicles and viral particles. So, is it, Im is it really important or is it not really important? For us, it's not important. But uh, some people say, if you don't have complete purification, how do you know the disease is caused, it's not caused by something else? To silence them, how come you guys didn't just show pictures from the gradient instead of just the culture? We, we, we first show it from the culture. Mm. By, just by centrifugation, you know, but not sequence gradient, just by making a pellet of the virus, you could uh, look at it also this way. But you, uh, here, of course, you have many impurities you know, coming from the cell. The sucrose gradient has the advantage to partly purify the virus, but again, even in the band of the virus, you have also cellular vesicles, which have the same density. 
but not the same look of course at the electron microscope. And you're saying that in the purified banding area there can be other contaminants and that's why pictures are essential? They, yes, in the purified, the, the method they used, you can get, by this method, you can get material which has, which is not viral, but it has proteins, it's cellular fragments. You know, the cellular fragments can, with this method he's using, could be at the same place. And then you can have there only cellular fragments, or you can have a mixture of cellular fragments and, and viruses. But it's important, it's extremely, it's, it's crucial to have a picture. If you separate by density 1.15 gram per ml, you have a lot of vesicular stuff inside. Not related to virus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Detritus, a reaction product of the cell. You have a lot of host cell constituents in that band. That's not too nice. So are there other particles that can look like retroviruses in that, in that band? Yes. In that material, you can have cellular fragments. And they have proteins, and they have RNA, which retroviruses have. And in fact, they may even look like retrovirus particles. So it is important to have, it is crucial to have an electron micrograph of the material for, for us, for example, and for many, any other scientists to believe what they are claiming. When you purify HIV, there are some challenges because the contam it's contaminated with cellular debris. But I said. And particles that look like retroviruses but are not infected. Yes, what I said. How do you distinguish between what is infective and what isn't? You cannot. Montagnier gives a very, himself gives a very, gives crucial importance to this band because he said if the particles do not bend at the 1.16 gram per mil band, then they are not retrovirus particles. The world See. accepted those papers and the pictures that he did present as being evidence of a new virus. Well, the world accepted these pictures and the world accepted that Montagnier proved the existence of HIV, but this is what we have not accepted from the very beginning. We've been questioning, we've been asking in scientific papers, and today neither Montagnier nobody, or anybody else has uh, responded to these uh, questions. Isn't there a chance that you're wrong since everybody concedes that Montagnier did isolate HIV and purify it? Well, who's seen it? We're giving you the evidence. And it's, to me, this evidence, and to my colleagues, this evidence does not prove the existence of HIV. Now, most of the people may have not even read the the Montagnier paper, and yet they accept that Montagnier proved the existence of HIV. We must not forget that doctors are very busy, and we, you, it is very hard for everyone to go and study in detail uh, all the claims. You have, to, you have to really put a lot of effort to put all the things together. But it's been 26 years since Montagnier published his papers. In 26 years, billions of dollars have been spent on HIV research. So doesn't the fact that, isn't, isn't Montagnier's paper kind of antiquated? I mean, hasn't it been proven that HIV does exist in the past 25, 26 years? Well, nobody has presented any better evidence for the existence of HIV than Montagnier and Gallo. Gallo presented similar evidence. Apart, the difference between Gallo and Montagnier was that Gallo used, uh, instead of umbilical t uh, lymphocyte T cells, he used uh, the leukemic cell line. Uh, but 
otherwise they, they, they publish the same findings. And their findings today, still even today, are the best evidence anyone has presented for the existence of HIV. So let's go to the test tube. What did Montagnier find in the purified band? Montagnier took the proteins from the band, which he said, or the material he said was purified to HIV, and then he reacted them with sera from his patient. And in the purified material, he found three proteins which reacted with antibodies, which were present in the sera of his patient. P80, P45, 41 now, and P24. He said 41 was a cellular protein which contaminated his virus, made no mention of P80, and he said P24 was viral. Well, the question is, why only P24 viral and not P80? From antibody antigen reaction, you cannot prove the origin either of the antibody or the, the, the protein. And he tried, he did not have evidence that P24 was coming from a particle. In fact, we did not know that there were any particles there. And then he said, he defined it by this reaction that P24 was viral and the antibodies were viral. This cannot be done scientifically. HIV is said to have nine proteins. Yes. But, um, but Montagnier only found one protein yes. in his purified culture. That's one of the big questions. If what he had there, what he called purified virus, it was HIV, and so it will have had all the proteins which a virus has, which HIV has, nine or ten proteins. And the patient, in the, the antibodies which reacted with the P24 should have, should have been also antibody to all these other proteins. And yet, he did not have, the patient did not have any antibodies to react with the other proteins, and we don't know if he had any of the other proteins. So this is a big question. You cannot have a virus which has only one protein. The question is now, if that was a, a protein, if he had purified virus, where were the other proteins? And if the patient was infected with the virus, where are the other antibodies? How can we, we have only one protein and one antibody? It is not, not possible. But unlike Montagnier, who considered P24 the only HIV protein, and 41 as being a cellular protein, Gallo in 1984 considered 41 as the most specific HIV protein and not a cellular protein. So maybe Montagnier was just wrong and Gallo was right. Unless you know that you have a purified virus, Unless you have evidence that there was a purified virus, you don't know which one is right. Because Gallo did not have any electron micrographs. Gallo could have said that 41 is uh, HIV if and only if he had published electron micrographs and showed that what he called purified virus had nothing else but virus-like particles. Now, the next criticism is that Montagnier's particles, he said that his particles are ty typical type C viruses. Then, in 1984, he said that his particles were type D particles. In Levy, at the same time, said that they were type D particles. Um, Gallo, again in 1984, said that he, the, the particles he seen were belonging to the family to, to which his previous viruses existed. And so, the, and they are type C particles. The, f, the two part retroviruses Garo claimed to have discovered, they were type C particles. And then, from, from about 1980, 85, 86, most of the HIV experts start saying that HIV is a lentivirus belonging to a totally a different subfamily of retroviruses. And, and even today, there is still disagreement as to what, even as to what subfamily and species the HIV particles belong. Anywhere you travel in the world, mm -hmm. you're going to find somebody 
that generally looks like somebody else. And when I look at electron micrographs, all viruses look the same to me. So is there really a difference between whether it's a C or a D or a lentivirus? Is it that big a deal? Well, there is a big deal because they belong to different, according to retrovirologists, they belong to different, not only to different species, but to different subfamilies. And this is not different than saying that people saying that they see, you know, one and the same thing, and yet what they see, some see a human being, others see a chimpanzee, and others see a gorilla. The difference is that much. We all belong to the same family. Chimpanzee, humans, and gorillas belong to the same family. All the retroviruses belong to the retroviral family. But we are in different species, and so are uh, the HIV particles. Would a trained eye be able to look under the microscope and easily distinguish between a type C, a type D, and a lentivirus? That's what they say. That's what the electron microscopy say. Using the electron microscope, how easy is it for you to differentiate between all these retroviruses? Because they all look, to someone like me, the untrained eye, they, they all look the same. Uh, certainly not. I will be able to teach you within half, half an hour. <laughs> we have made a nice summary on, on these structural differences. You can measure. And if you start measuring the ribonucleoprotein, that's a complex of the genome and some protein, where is it in the virion, in the budding, in the immature particle? How is that organized in the mature particle? versus the immature particle. What about the glycoprotein knobs? These are questions that can be quantitatively assessed. So you really can make an objective diagnosis. So for someone like you, it's easy to tell the difference? Yes. Yeah. The, the cone-shaped core yeah. is um, very identifiable. It looks very different than a C-type, is that right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <clears throat> Okay, or at least to the trained eye. No, no, <coughs> you will see it. Oh, okay. <laughs> How come, in your opinion, did Gallo and Montagnier see C-type instead of Lenti when they looked in under their electron microscopes? Because they uh, had it in the brain. Oh, they saw what they wanted to see? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Still, the purification is the biggest problem, the purification. Once, if you don't have purified, if you have no good purification, as Montagnier said, if you have no good, you got to have purification to be able to characterize the virus. Even if, we, if one assumes that Montagnier and Gallo and the particles are retroviral particles, the reverse transcriptase is uh, specific to retroviruses, to say that you have a unique retrovirus, you must characterize, you must, its proteins and its RNA. You must show that these have proteins and RNA which is not present in other retroviruses. And why in your mind is there such uh, inconsistencies in identifying the virus among the experts? Uh, the particles? Yes. I don't know. We cannot say that you have a new retrovirus unless you show that it has unique, partic unique proteins and unique RNA. And to show that, you must purify the virus. There is no other way. If you say that these proteins and this RNA are HIV RNA and HIV protein, you must somehow obtain them from the virus particles. But because the viral particles are so small, the next best thing is to obtain them from a mass of material which contain nothing else but retrovirus particles. Well, when I talked to Flossie Wongstall, she said that you don't necessarily have to take pictures. You can go to the culture and look for viruses budding as evidence of release of virus. Yes. As I said to you, budding and retrovirus-like particles, just seeing them in the culture, there is no proof that they are retrovirus. That is no evidence. Take pictures from the culture. It's no proof that they are virus. And certainly, you cannot prove just looking 
that uh, there are so many things there in the culture which also contain proteins, which also contain RNA and contain DNA. To say that HIV has nine proteins and HIV has a genome, a unique genome, nine uh, genes, you must take, you must have evidence that these proteins originated from the viral particles. And to do that, you must take these particles out from the culture. You got to have them out. You, you must purify them. You must obtain them separate from everything else which contains proteins. She said that there were problems that when you spin the particles under the high-speed centrifuge, yes. that they often distort or they lose their envelope or they break apart. And that's why it's, it's almost impossible to purify viruses. No, there are many, many pictures of uh, electromicrographs of retroviruses which have been purified. You know, I can show you, including this one, a rooster coma virus. When you take somebody to, to court for a paternity suit, mm -hmm. you must have evidence that the blood originated from the father and from the child. There is no other way. You must have proof that they originated from the father and from the child to compare the DNA. The same way, if you want to say that these proteins are from HIV, you must have them coming from HIV. But the particles are too small, so the best next thing is to purify viruses. And this is not me who says it. I mean, this is all the travelogists, including uh, Montagnier, including Charmaine, including Baresi Nussi. That is, you know, this is so simple. Mm -hmm. So you must have purification. That is the only way. You see, this is what the HIV. Retroviruses have a matter of 100 to 120 nanometers. They have a cone-shaped core. They have the lateral bodies and they have knobs. What are the knobs? When we see uh, HIV being diagrammatically represented, you see there, there are some spikes coming out from the particle. And these knobs are extremely important for effectivity. Again, according to all the HIV experts, if you the knobs are crucial. They are essential for infection. No knobs, no infection and there is no infection, the particles cannot be viruses. So a complex process of an interaction of the outer protein of the virus called the envelope with molecules on the surface of the cell are essential for a virus to enter the cell. And when we speak of entry, we essentially mean the guts or the internal component of the virus that contains its genetic information in the form of RNA and certain other proteins. Today, nobody has proven the existence of knobs in the cell-free particles. Obviously, when we first uh, uh, were working on the cause of, of AIDS, we had to be very broadly, uh, have our ability to include a whole variety of different potential organs, organisms that could cause it. What was helpful um, in, the, in the limiting of, of our search uh, were the cases in hemophiliacs where the material that's used to treat hemophilia comes from blood of, 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 or plasma, a subcomponent of blood that is sold or donated into the system and then a purification process is, is used to take that large volume of plasma and, and specifically pull out the anti-hemophiliac um, factors that actually can treat the hemophiliacs. Now in that process, the, the, the one thing you want to, uh, you have to realize is that material is given intravenously to uh, the hemophiliacs to treat them and you have to have it very clean. You don't want to have any infectious agents in that if you can avoid it. And one of the easiest ways to do any of uh, preparation of a drug is to filter it. Now we have these wonderful modern filters where you can work on your 
your drug and then the last, the last step before you put it in the bottle, pass it through a filter that filters out all infectious agents. Now I say all, uh, meaning that the filter can only filter out those that the filter can catch, which is the bigger agents. That bacteria um, and parasites are much bigger than viruses, and those filters indeed will filter out all the bacteria and make it quote sterile. That is, you cannot grow bacteria from it. Uh, so, but yet we knew that after this process, that they were still getting this disease, um, which could have been caused by a virus, a bacteria, or parasitic disease, or whatever. But since all of the larger bacteria and parasites are eliminated in these filters, then you can assume that the disease. Uh, that you're looking at is caused by a virus. And does it also filter out the infected cells? So is it just pure free-floating HIV virus? The, the factor eight material is cell-free, so it's a, the only liquid material. And that, that liquid material would can, could contain many infectious agents from the donors of all these. Literally, there's hundreds of, of donors in each of these batches. Um, and when you filter it out, you filter out all the bigger organisms, that is, bacteria and parasites, you're only left with viruses that go through the filter. I reckoned that a virus that would survive the purification of clotting factors from human blood uh, was more likely to be a virus without a cell membrane, a small virus like a parvovirus, and uh, I would not have put a retrovirus at the top of the list. And yet, when HIV was discovered, uh, it was indeed a retrovirus. I think my scientific reasoning was perfectly correct, um, but uh, uh, I was deluding myself nonetheless. Is there something harsh about the factor process? Could... Well, I didn't realize how unharsh uh, the purification of clotting factors is. We were talking about purification. Those clotting factors are anything but pure and they were tainted with this virus. They were tainted with hepatitis B virus, with hepatitis C virus, which also was not discovered until long after HIV was discovered. So uh, HIV was just one of several viruses that was passed in clotting factors. Now here it is a paper which was published by several authors, uh, which, uh, uh, with a co-author, Geldenblum, and they say, they have found that on the average, after, immediately after release, after the knobs are released, the particles into the fluid, there are 0.5 knobs per particle. And they said even these 0.5 knobs, they may be false positive. That is, there are no knobs at all. The knobs here look like little knobs everywhere. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay. There's a chance that you have some dirt, of course, in the cell culture. And these would be knobs from a particle that is cut tangentially. Here's the same. That's my interpretation. So my interpretation. But here are the knobs. Here might be some, there might be some dirt here, sure. That is dirt from preparation. Mm -hmm. But aren't, don't these look like knobs too, coming off of this big one? Yeah, you know, they are glycoproteins also on the cell. Okay. Yeah. Now, we have to differentiate between them. If we would like to go for differentiation, we have to use immuno-electron microscopy to make a tag. It's either the glycoprotein or it's something different. <clears throat> in, in a paper published in, in 2003, the author state, the cost of GP120, that is the knobs, do not form spikes on the surface of HIV as is commonly described in the literature. We suggest the spike snob observed by negative staining electron microscopy may be an artifact of the penetration of heavy metal stains between the envelope proteins. What exactly does that mean? That means that despite some people 
claims that there are knobs on the HIV particles, these authors say that the particles have no knobs, in plain language. This is a paper published in 2006 in Nature. Here it is sieve, semen immunodeficiency virus. And in these particles, you can see many knobs. But when you come to the electron micrograph on, of what is meant to be HIV particles, there are hardly any knobs. In fact, we can see only one there, but you can see the same thing down there. And you don't know if there are knobs or there is some artifact there. In fact, the authors call them putative, putative knobs. Or putative means supposed, supposedly HIV knobs. Mm -hmm. So the authors do not have, even today, proof that the HIV particles have knobs which are crucial for infection. Even if we admit, you know, even if we accept that there are knobs, there are 0.5 knobs immediately per particle on the average, immediately after they are released, they are lost. Even this small number is lost very rapidly, according to Geldenblum. And these knobs being lost so rapidly, and, H and factor eight preparation taking a long time from the time it is, the blood is taken to the time factor eight is prepared, is a long time. And even after it is prepared, may stay on the bench for months before it is used. So it is impossible for hemophiliacs, the, the factor VIII, to contain an infectious HIV particle, even if HIV exists. I wanted to ask you about hemophiliacs. Because they had cell-free uh, plasma, it was just the virus. But the virus sheds its membranes within 24 hours. So how, one thing we can go is, how is it able to actually infect the T cells? Yes, it's a question, but uh, uh, we have to know that uh, all the fraction of the blood could be infectious. And there is some virus bound to red blood cells which could be released also in, in the plasma after uh, treatment or incubation. Some virus is bound to red cells also as well. Uh, so uh, perhaps there are more virus when you process the blood, more virus could come in the plasma, okay? And the, these virus could be protected by the plasma proteins from denaturation. This is one, uh, one thing, possible, one possibility. The other is the quality of the host. Uh, hemophiliacs are fragile. Being transfused many times, the immune system also is uh, depressed before they get infected with HIV. So they are prone to HIV infection because of their immune system uh, weakness, okay? So combining this with the fact that the virus could exist also in forms, which I'm studying now, which probably are more resistant than uh, we think for the usual particles, could explain. The little ones. Yes, little ones or they bound to Macroplasma proteins, you know, that's uh, possible that mac macro macroplasma are more resistant, perhaps. Macroplasma envelope could be more resistant than the viral envelope. Okay. The, is but the, the, there are all, all hypotheses. I'm not, uh, this is not based on solid data, of course. This is just, assum this, they are just assumption. But to, you are right. This is, an, uh, we have to explain why hemophiles have been so easily infected with uh, plasma products. For you, the entire existence of HIV rests upon the fact that there are no pictures of the purified gradient. Is that correct? It is part of it. That is the most crucial evidence which you need. If that you don't have these pictures, which prove that the, there are in the purified virus, there are the, what they call purified virus, there are virus-like particles, then the whole experiment and thus the existence of HIV it's finished. And you're saying today there is no pictures of purified virus? Today there is no pictures of purified virus. 
Цетели, Монтанија един од паблишит, Гало един од паблишит, Леви един од паблиш сач пикчас, Вајз един од паблиш сач пикчас. And the only pictures which have been published was, in, in fact, this is admitted by the Franco-German researchers in, in 1997, when the first attempts, uh, the first pictures of what is called purified HIV were published by two groups, one from the United States and one fr in a Franco-German study. You said that in 1997 they did try to purify HIV, is that correct? Yes. And you're saying they weren't successful? They are not successful. And what is more important, these authors, they, they uh, accepted or they admitted, but by 1997 there is no evidence for purification. And here it is. This is from the Franco-German study. Virus to be used for biochemical and serological analysis, or as an immunogen, that is as an antigen, is frequently prepared by centrifugation through sucrose gradients. And they said, in none of these studies has the purity of the virus preparation been verified. So by 1997, there is no proof that HIV has been purified. Did they purify HIV? They tried. So, they accepted this. As I said, we've been asking this f for the very beginning to have some evidence for HIV purification. And these authors tried to present, or they did their best to purify HIV. And here is their evidence. This is the Franco-German study. In the head material, which is meant to represent purified HIV. The top and the middle is obtained, is material obtained from infected cultures and is meant to represent uh, purified HIV. The bottom part is material obtained in the similar manner from non-infected cultures. And as you can see, the arrows, they said, represent the HIV particles. First of all, this cannot be said to be purified virus. As you can see, they are not purified particles. In fact, only the, the particles which they, they put the arrows are said to be particles which look like HIV. The rest are all cellular fragments, or called mm, vesicles. In, the, in uh, the, the material which is obtained from the non-infected cultures, you can see even there, there are some particles which may look like the one which has erod. So it is significant, significant that the authors do not call this material purified HIV. In fact, they call it purified vesicles from infected H9 cells, the top, and activated cells. So the authors admit that this cannot be considered purified HIV. With all the effort they, they put, they could not obtain purified HIV. Okay. It is also important that the, the, the particles which are aerot as representing HIV, they don't have all the morphological characteristics attributed to HIV. They, there is no evidence for knobs. In fact, even their diameter is uh, uh, higher than what is considered to be the, the retroviral particles. But does size really matter? I mean, humans vary in sizes. They matter because oh, the, 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 this in, in the Franco-German is the size is they are larger, but not as large as in the, in the American uh, evidence for purification. Here is the effort by the American researchers in purifying HIV. These are their results. And yes, you can see they did not, were not able to obtain purified HIV. 
And again, the particles which are uh, arrowed and are said to represent HIV, mm -hmm. they do not have all the morphological characteristics attributed to lentiviruses. And in fact, they don't have the knobs, they don't have uh, cone-shaped core, you cannot see there. They don't have lateral bodies, which are, uh, they should be in HIV. And most importantly, their diameter is too, they're too large. The average diameter of the, of the, uh, of the particle is 220, 234. And none has a diameter less than 160 just by taking their diameter, it is impossible the, the particles which are labeled as HIV to be HIV. Is the size also important in determining what you're looking at? Yeah. <clears throat> Think about uh, viruses can be as big as pox viruses, up to 300 nanometer, HIV up to 150. The smallest autonomously drawing virus will be a circle virus, just 15 oh, wow. nanometer. So what's the smallest HIV particle that's ever been documented? Uh, I think it's, it's something, one, 120 to 150. No, these are fixed morphological entities. They don't change. They don't change. Hmm? So that's, that's a huge thing in helping you differentiate whether it's HIV or yeah, not. Yeah. The size of a structure is very important to make the diagnosis. Now, if the particles which are labeled by Bess and his colleagues as being HIV, then the, the absolutely necessary condition is for the material which was obtained from, uh, f from the infected cultures to have proteins which are not present in the material which was obtained from non-infected cultures. Right. Is yeah. this, but this does not seem to be the case. And in fact, Bess and his colleagues have come with this evidence. They took the proteins from all the three bands they had, from the two infected cultures, or the, or the, the called infected cultures, and from the non-infected cultures. And here are the proteins from the non-infected cultures, which they are put in a strip. Here are the proteins from the two infected cultures. As you can see, if you look at this, oh, there is a difference, but the difference between the, the strips is only quantitative. That is, we have these bands in all the strips. Only there is less here. Similarly with all the other proteins. In some of them, in fact, they are exactly the same. So by looking at these pictures, the proteins which existed in the purified material, the HIV purified material, any of the material which was obtained from the non-infected cultures contain the same proteins, which means that none of these uh, cultures contained HIV. As I said, if the cultures which contain, they say, contain HIV, they should, must have had proteins which are not present in the non-infected cultures. And yet, this is not the case. The proteins, all the proteins are found, which are found in the infected, the so-called infected cultures, they are also found in the non-infected cultures, some of them in smaller quantities, but nonetheless, they are there. The difference may be just because the way the cultures were conducted. The American authors labeled the, some of the proteins. And the, the P6, P7, P17, and P24 are labeled as HIV proteins. And these two proteins, that is, proteins which are around 32 and around 41, they were labeled as cellular proteins. No label is put in the proteins which had molecular weight higher than 41. Yet there are many HIV proteins which have 
molecular weight. Now, why they didn't label them? First, all the proteins which are around 41 and 32 are non-HIV. They cannot be HIV proteins with molecular weight 41 or around 41 and molecular weight of 32 or around 32. Okay. We ask best why they labeled uh, these other three proteins as HIV. And he said that they put this label because that's what the reviewer asked them. But they did not have evidence themselves that they were HIV proteins. He stated that they did not have evidence that they were HIV proteins? Yes, he stated that they did not obtain themselves, but the reviewer asked them to label them as HIV proteins. And he said the reviewer was right. We label them HIV. Did he specifically state they had no evidence those were HIV proteins? Personally, they did not have evidence. Yes. Best said that. Yes. In this, in this experiment, they did not obtain evidence. In this experiment, they did not obtain evidence that these proteins were HIV. But they labeled them HIV because the reviewer asked them. So the question is why they didn't label mm -hmm. the proteins higher than 41. Well, there, must, there are some good reasons for it. First of all, many HIV experts, not, maybe not all of them, but many HIV experts accept that the protein of 120 and 160 are polymers of P41. That is, they are 41 joined together. Three 41 are joined together and are made 120. 441 are joined together and are make 160. They admit all the proteins above, above 24. There is evidence that the protein above 24,000 molecular weight are cellular proteins. And they also know that the proteins, well, is molecular weight lower than uh, the P17, P6, uh, P7, they are subunits of proteins with a high molecular weight. So now we are left with one protein, P24. We come back. Now what is 24? Well, to answer that question, we have to, to go to an interview which Montagnier gave to the uh, French uh, investigative journalist Jamel Tahi. Jamel Tahi asked Montagnier why they didn't publish any electron micrographs of the material which they said represented purified virus. And Montagnier responded, we found some particles, but they did not have the morphology typical of retroviruses. Jamel Tahi insisted to, uh, to find why, how it was possible that they did not publish when they claim that they have purified it. Mm -hmm. And then his, and they, in the purified virus, they did not have typical, even, even retrovirus-like particles, much less HIV and much less purified. Montagnier repeated, I repeat, we did not purify it. Then he was asked if Gallo purified it. And Montagnier responded, I do not know if he, Gallo, really purified. I don't believe so. Jamel Tehi asked Montagnier, do any picture from the purif for, for purification exist? Montagnier responded, yes, of course. Have they been published? Montagnier, I could not tell you. We have some somewhere, but it's not of interest, not of any interest. Of, for us, it's of very great interest. It's crucial. If you don't have them, then there's no way you can prove the existence of HIV. Mm -hmm. and then we ask Gallo. Montagnier subsequently published many in pictures of purified HIV particles, as of course we did in our first paper. 
you have no need to worry. The evidence is obvious and overwhelming. Oh, there was no pictures of purified virus in Montagnier's, in Gallo's uh, 1984 papers or of any other of Gallo's publications. Going back to 1983, when trying to prove the existence of a new virus, why was purification important? It was important to, pre to prepare uh, uh, kits for antibody detection. Okay, because we wanted this uh, uh, diagnosis kits to be as specific as possible. Okay. Okay. If you use a preparation with, of virus which is not purified, of course you uh, will detect antibody to everything, not only against the virus, but also against all the proteins that are produced in the supernatant. Okay. Now, these, all these pictures here, yeah. are these all from culture? Yeah. All from culture. Do, I, you, do you have any from the gradient? Yeah. There's 80% of dirt. Oh, 80% of dirt. Yeah. Oh. And therefore, I didn't like that. But it was necessary for, also for us to control because this house in 85 already established ELISA antigen material for testing people. Oh. There was nothing commercially available, but we had to purify. We had to look at the material that was used for the ELISA. 80% dirt. Okay. okay. That's the truth. Again, Jamel Tahi interviewed uh, Charles Doge, which was the electron microscopist at the Pasteur Institute. And he, in his response, he said what in the purified virus, they had only cellular debris. They never had virus. Which means that the P24 protein originated from a material which contained not even retrovirus particles, much less purified virus. So in 2001, the EM specialist from Pasteur admitted they never saw anything? Yes. Yes, he admitted that they never saw any virus-like particles, much less purified virus. In fact, what they had there was cellular debris all the way long. Well, what's the purpose of the purification then? Well, to, uh, to make sure uh, uh, you have uh, a real virus, uh, you know. Uh. The P24 originated from a material which did not even have virus-like particles much less purified virus. So cellular debris? We, yes, had only cellular debris, which means you cannot have a better evidence that P24 is a cellular protein, cannot be HIV. If it originated from a material that contains only cellular fragments, it has to be a cellular protein. Now, even if we assume that P24 is an HIV protein and that Montagnier discovered the first one protein virus, this creates even a bigger problem. This is because retroviruses have an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which is a protein. That's why they are called retroviruses. Their name derives from this protein. If they don't have this protein, if they don't have this enzyme, the virus cannot be a retrovirus. That will be like having an object which does not have any wings and yet you still call it an aeroplane. Now, we know that in his experiments, Montagnier found revenge transcriptase activity. And on the basis of this activity, he claimed to have proven infection of brew and his cell cultures with HIV, as well as detection 
transmission and isolation of HIV. This P24 is not a reverse transcriptase protein, as you can see from the picture. It means that all Montagnier did was prove what they all knew all along. Reverse transcriptase activity is not specific to retroviruses. Under the right conditions, it can be detected in all cells infected with a retrovirus or non-infected with a retrovirus. If there are no HIV proteins, there can be no HIV genome. What Montagnier and Gallo call the HIV genome is nothing more than a form of RNA known as adenine-rich RNA, which they found at the 1.16 gram per mil band, among other RNAs and DNAs, despite the fact that Gallo never published proof that the band contained retrovirus particles, and Montagnier admitted he did not have any, they called this RNA HIV RNA. It's even worse. Gallo knew as far back as 1972 that adenine-rich RNA is not specific to retroviruses. This type of RNA can be found in any cells which are synthesizing proteins. In any case, the existence of HIV and even its causative role in AIDS were both accepted well before any genomic studies were published. Today, we have not yet proof for the existence of any of the HIV proteins. And if you don't have proof for the existence of other proteins, you cannot have proof for the existence of the virus. Well, what's the purpose of the purification then? Well, to, uh, to make sure uh, uh, you have a, a real virus, uh, you know. Uh. How come you guys didn't just show pictures from the gradient? We, we, we first show it from the culture. Mm -hmm. by, just by centrifugation, you know, but not the cross gradient. From the pictures alone, though, in culture, you can't prove what virus you found yet. Of course, electron microscopy is not sufficient to, to prove you have a retrovirus, that's clear. You need uh, other characteristics like the density. The reverse transcriptase activity is the key. We didn't describe the electron microscopy as a proof. Mm -hmm. We described the reverse transcriptase activity as a proof. As a proof it was a retroviral. No, reverse transcription is actually very widespread. Something like 50% of the DNA in our cells comes about by reverse transcription. When I said 50%, I'm saying 50% of the DNA came about by reverse transcription. But it's not all retroviruses. The problem is that they detected non they didn't they detected non specific phenomena. Reverse transcription, particles, and we've seen all the problems with particles, and antigen antibody reactions. And so you can't take a whole lot of things that might be something and turn them into that something. That's the problem. You, if, I mean if you're walking down the if you walk into a an empty space and you find an engine block and a, a fan belt and a and a generator lying on the ground, what do you say you've got? Do you know what you've got? I mean, is that a, is that a, is that a car? Is, is, could it be a boat? Could it be a plane? Could it be something someone uses on a farm to lift grain up? It could be all those things. You can't you, you can't make something specific out of a whole lot of things that are non-specific. So they didn't. They used a whole lot of non-specific and just preferred to believe that this is what they'd found. What Montagnier did is 
similar to a fisherman throwing his net into the ocean, pulling it back, looks at it, finds no fish, and yet he claims that not only that he has fish, but he has nothing else but fish, and all of the same kind, HIV.